when we talk about Web3, it's such a broad term, right? You can, I'm talking about crypto and NFTs and the metaverse and all these different terms that, that can fall under that umbrella. Um, and it depends on who you talk to and, and what exactly it represents. But I'm specifically interested in what, um, what DAOs are, right? And what they can mean for the future. And, and you have a lot of experience in this field. So for folks who aren't familiar with the concept of a DAO, can you explain it to us? You can explain it to Web3 insiders, but explain it to folks who you know, may not have heard of this before. Yeah, I mean, DAOs are fundamentally, uh, or at least right now, different groups of people that want to organize online with a shared bank account. So you could think of it like a, you know, a subreddit with a bank account or a Facebook group with a bank account, a bunch of people, and not just a handful of people, but a larger number, let's say like, you know, um, maybe a hundred or so, maybe several thousand, they're getting together under kind of some shared interest that could be acquiring the constitution, that could be something else. And they're working together, um, even though they don't necessarily know or trust one another to achieve some sort of purpose because they can control uh, the assets that are in a bank account. And I think that's very important, right? I think we've seen lots of people get uh, together online for different reasons, to talk about different topics that they're interested in, possibly to effectuate political change or to you know, uh, riff on different concepts. And that's great, but it's a little ephemeral and it's a little limited in its scope. When you add a financial component to these groups, you enable them to turn into something that's much broader, much larger, and hopefully something that can begin to effectuate. It seems like there's this consensus that um, there have been problems with government, with larger organizations, and, um, and, and this is a response. People gathering in this way uh, is a response to a certain moment where people feel like, well, we can have control in this way, we can fund in this way, we can gather and organize because we feel like we've been failed in other ways. Is that, is that fair to say? I mean, I think in part, you know, I think centralized organizations are great at many things, right? And we've lived through, you know, particularly the post-war period in the U.S. And, you know, we've achieved great things, going to the moon, building massive companies that improve people's lives. Um, but, you know, as the world has become increasingly global, as we've increasingly live our lives online, uh, I think we realize that the connection points uh, that we have with people, uh, particularly over the internet, uh, just need a different form of coordination. Uh, if you're you know, coalescing with a whole bunch of different people online, it's kind of hard to imagine a hierarchical structure where you like appoint the CEO of a Facebook group or like a, a subreddit. It just doesn't make as much sense. Um, so I think it's naturally uh, kind of leans towards flatter structures that are less hierarchical, you know, less top down and a little bit flatter and a little less defined. And I think that's what people are, are really gravitating uh, towards. What do you think will be one of the most disruptive applications of a DAO? I think we're at a moment that's very important when it comes to organizations. Now that groups of people can organize online, it doesn't take much to start realizing what the implications are of that, right? Um, you know, the implications can transform the way we pool capital and deploy it. You know, it's a big part of the U.S. economy. It's a big part of the, the global economy. It can change the way people work. I think lots of folks have been interested in flatter, more participatory structures, structures that look like co-ops where uh, workers or other folks felt like they were being fairly treated. And I think that would um, you know, be a positive change and one that would hopefully make people's lives better. Um, and I think the broadest uh, kind of uh, congregating organization that impacts uh, people's lives are kind of governmental structures. So it's not inconceivable that you can imagine DAOs being used to either effectuate political change uh, and or uh, eventually become kind of an organ of a, a political body in and of itself. So Part of Web3 is, is hard for um, folks on the outside to understand because it seems just in theory. So can you paint a picture of what that could actually look like? A, a, a governmental mm -hmm. uh, body DAO. I don't think anybody fully knows what that looks right. like, but you know, at its core, what does the government do? It assembles a pool of, of capital and it redistributes it. And it has participatory voting on top, at least in the US, to determine how those funds should be allocated. And that's at a core what a DAO is doing, right? At a small scale right now, it has a pool of funds. Uh, people are often voting to determine how those funds are allocated. Um, and then those allocations of funds just happen a lot faster than they do in the traditional world. Uh, so you can imagine like a leaner, meaner, more participatory, more well-functioning uh, form of a democratic government uh, at the end of the day with DAOs, which could be great. Um, you know, less delegation to specific politicians, um, you know, possibly 
uh, new ways to to kind of uh, sum up votes of different people, hmm. um, more digitally native. You're not walking down to the ballot box if you needed to to make a vote. You could do it from your phone, or you could uh, you you know could delegate it to your mom if you think she makes better decisions than you do with with regard to certain uh, political topics, or a friend, or your significant other. So you know you can imagine kind of different models that are fundamentally the same, but a little bit more efficient and possibly better in the long run. Facebook just changed its name to Meta. You know, I know a lot of folks have lots of opinions know, on noticed. that. Do we yeah. think Facebook is gonna create a DAO? Would you Would you guys support a Facebook DAO? I mean, I, I don't, we really are driven by our members in terms of what they want to support. Um, I think it's great that, you know, Facebook is agile enough to, to kind of shift the focus of their business to their credit. Um, you know, the, the skepticism that I just have around approaches for any company, and this is not Facebook specifically, is you know for these metaverses or um, or digital worlds or uh, things of value that people want to trade online, you can't really have it owned by any one party uh, because it's hard to trust that one party. You're pretty much agreeing to live in a company town if it's a metaverse, or you're beholden to you know a centralized actor if it's a uh, you know a, you know some something of value that you're trading or or want to secure or pen. And we did that in Web2, right? If for payments, we had PayPal, it's, it was amazing, but it didn't you know, ever achieve this kind of global scope of a global asset or global currency. Uh, so I just have questions as to whether or not one centralized business can really build out a metaverse. Um, I don't think everybody kind of wants to live in a company town, uh, which effectively it kind of would feel like, I think, at the end of the day. Do you think that DAOs have the power to transform democracy? I think they give um, DAOs and or blockchain technology off the bat are just new fertile areas for experimentation on participatory uh, governance. So voting-based governance. Uh, you know, it's much cheaper to lodge a vote and, and uh, using blockchain technology. It's not secure enough or private enough for public, uh, you know, public-related voting yet. So the types of things we do when we vote for a president or we vote for, you know, our, our Congress, uh, Congress people. Uh, but I do think it just gives new... Uh, ability for a whole bunch of different people to just start thinking about these questions again and hopefully improve them. I think, you know, that experiment in purchasing the constitution really distilled down a lot of concepts. And right? can you the explain that to... really quick, just in short for folks yeah. who haven't heard? I mean, it was it was a, a really fascinating experiment that went mainstream called Constitution Dow. And just give us the, the quick highlights on it. Sure. Yeah. So there was a, uh, a version of the constitution that was being auctioned by a major auction house. Uh, and it hadn't been auctioned since I think the late 1980s. Um, so it's your, you know, your chance to own a piece of history, right? If you think America is great and you believe in its kind of guiding principles, what better way to kind of, um, you know, support that than owning that piece of history? I guess that would be the kind of the tagline. And so people really became excited about the idea of pooling together assets, digital assets, things like uh, Ether, and buying the Constitution. Um, and then having kind of the, uh, the constitution uh, be managed by this collective group. And so people began to pull together assets and work, work together in different ways in order to, um, in order to, to try to make that a, a reality. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition. A large hedge fund uh, owner uh, ultimately won the rights to the constitution. Uh, or this version of the constitution. So it's kind of interesting, right? You had this like swarm that emerged online right. rapidly that was trying to to buy the constitution versus like a centralized, very wealthy individual who obviously wanted to collect it for his collection. Uh, but it just shows some powerful things, right? A, people working together, even though they don't know or necessarily want or trust one another. B, just the ability to really pull together assets nearly seamlessly across the internet. That's just something we haven't had before. Uh, and three, it was just fun. And I think people had a great time with it. They liked this idea of being able to work towards something that was a little bit bigger than themselves. That was, you know, ultimately, I think at its core, a positive exercise, right? They were trying to do something that they viewed was good um, and respectful. You know, it seems to, to me that I remember this because it did seem like, OK, this is a breakthrough moment for this concept of DAOs because we all understand the Constitution, what it means. And wow, to own a piece of history and do it with all of these different folks and collectively organize online. Well, there now I understand right what this this exactly. could do. Um, and then I remember there was controversy afterwards, right? Folks were trying to get money back. They couldn't do it. It was messy, right? So it's hard for us to create this totally utopian picture because it's really still messy, right? You talk back um, 
about 2016, you referenced the DAO, which was this startup that created um, the DAO that was hacked. Uh, and I think it was something like $50 million worth of Ethereum that was taken before they were able to stop it. And it was, you know, this moment for everyone that was a, a, a pause and as you said, like a spectacular failure. So obviously it's not a straight line. So what do you say as someone who lives and breathes these worlds, as people are getting into DAOs, joining these these ecosystems, putting money in, wanting to get involved, what are the risks? Um, and you know, how do we build these communities with security in mind and with, you know, thinking about a lot of these things? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely like the Wild West period for blockchain technology. Um, you know, and I think we all hear like these famous stories about bank robberies and mm -hmm you know, wild roving bands of people that may take advantage uh, of you. I think it has kind of that same spirit. So participating now is not necessarily for the faint of heart. It's hard technically. Uh, there's lots of frictions and pain points and unexpected behavior if you're not familiar with it. Um, I think part of that is just a learning process. You know, it took time uh, when the internet came out and, you know, largely in web one for people to learn how to email, to how to search, right. And how to click buttons and understand kind of these subtle UX mechanics that yeah. are now firmly ingrained in our minds. So there's a bit of a learning curve. There's lots of work that needs to be done at the technical level to make it better. Um, and there's a lot of well-intentioned people that are trying to do that. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, once we understand what those risks are and those pain points, I'm sure we'll find and see the U.S. just apply a sensible layer of regulation to kind of minimize some of those risks to the extent that they're present. Um, so it's an experimentation phase. I think it's going to be that way for the next couple of years. That's exciting. Lots of opportunities, but there's obviously risks related to it. You know, back in August, an expert in the Web3 space tweeted some things, tweeted this sentiment that I thought was fascinating. Basically, he he said, you know, he was talking and said a nation state is a government organized around a nation. And then he said a network state is a government organized around a social network. Um, is the future we're going to enter a future where we'll see these network states to some degree? I mean, it possibly could be. I, I do think we're, we're, we've are we seen and are increasingly seeing just the power of network technology, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or some of these other large networks that have been developed over the past 10 years. Um, and I do think at its core, blockchain technologies are another network, whether that's Bitcoin or Ethereum. DAOs themselves are networks, right? They're different groups of people that are working together. So you're kind of starting to see this like layers of networks that are emerging um, and they're incredibly powerful. And I imagine um, they'll continue to, to be powerful, whether they lead up to a network state. I'm not 100% sure right. exactly what, what that means, but uh, I do think, you know, the core of that uh, comment is really, you know, networks are really powerful. Um, so maybe we should think about as a society, not just necessarily how to build powerful networks, but what's the right way to govern those networks. Right. And my sense is the answer to that question is, is going to be found in Web3 and in some of the conversations around DAOs and crypto. You know, although in all fairness, it's really the barriers to entry. Um, I love this idea of Web3 and decentralization and people uh, coming together and being able to, to create and organize in a more decentralized way. But, you know, the reality is there are barriers to entry and it's hard. And there are certain types of people right now, those are access driven insiders, folks too, who have money that are able to get in. So it's my worry sometimes is that this world that is full of promise is being built by those access driven insiders. Yeah, I, I think that's always uh, the risk, right? If you you have barriers to entry, uh, technology is doesn't come out of the box perfect. It's an iterative process, um, you know, and only some People are willing, this kind of early adopter class is willing to kind of suffer through the, the warts and hair and, and you know, frustrations of using like a, a product that's not fully refined. Um, and I think, you know, in part, you know, some of the barriers to entry are actually um, uh, remnants of our regulatory system and there's a lack of clarity. So that creates certain barriers that I think are unfortunate. Um, when it comes to the technical barriers, I do think that there are obviously people that have been doing this for quite some time that have been a part of it for a while, uh, but it is pretty open and permissionless. And then on top of that, I do think a lot of the people that are developing it do not want to run big monolithic corporations. They really do want the community to sit at the center. I think um, I think back to this time last year, I had embedded with uh, QAnon for a story and I did an investigation on QAnon and it was fa I thought the group itself was fascinating. There were lots of implications. The story came out on um, I became a Q drop. And so the next couple of days were, 
as you can imagine, very unpleasant. And I think about what that experience would have been like for me had QAnon had a DAO and had QAnon had a balance sheet, right? And they could have done much more than troll. And so I'm curious, as we talk about the incredible innovation that will come along with DAOs and what they can do for organizations, what, do, you know, what will this mean for the future of groups like QAnon? Um, even you mentioned something about things are going to get really weird if 4chan now um, is armed with a digital bank account. Right. So I think, you know, we've seen online groups of all different stripes, right, from, you know, um, you know, different groups that are super positive in nature, trying to effectuate positive changes. We've obviously seen groups of people come together to, you know, effectuate some sort of chaos or something that I think a lot of folks would find socially undesirable. Uh, so I always like to flip these questions on its on its head, and I think that's what you're doing with the question, right? Um, and what are like the the downsides? Uh, I do think that that's going to be something that emerges, right? A, a group of people that are not interested in effectuating positive change, but something more negative or nefarious could pool together funds uh, from across the globe and use that for some more destructive purpose. My hope is, though, uh, that by having some sort of financial incentive, the 4chan group or some other group um, now actually has an incentive to not just sit there all day and try to make it a race to the bottom, but actually do something that's more productive that can lift themselves up. So I was joking with somebody about this, that it's kind of like, hopefully DAOs like enable a lot of the folks on 4chan to like put on the suit, comb their hair, uh, and maybe do something like a little bit more productive with their, with their lives, because they kind of have a shared incentive to do that. Uh, so I think it's too soon to, to know exactly what that looks like. Um, but I do think, you know, like anything, uh, technology can be used for good or bad. Uh, my hope, though, is if this core ethos of community support, open source technology uh, really carries through, that uh, hopefully, you know, those downside risks are, are mitigated in part uh, over the long run. Yeah. When you wrote 4chan will at some point morph into a DAO armed with a digital bank account. If you thought the Internet was weird, it's going to get weirder. I thought that was just such a powerful statement. Like, how weird are we going to get? Can you just just warn me I, now? How weird is the, are things going to get? I think it's it's going to get so weird that maybe <laughs> your mom or grandma may not want to uh, participate in DAOs. But I think that's a good thing. You know, I think you know with that weirdness, you get new ideas and innovations and thoughts. I, you know, I think many of us have felt like a bit of a stagnation when it comes to different parts of society. And hopefully, this shakes things up. And at the end of the day, we're we're getting you know, new things, new forms of human expression, and, and hopefully better ways for us to all work together. And if these uh, downside issues emerge, you know, hopefully we can, you know, take steps to, to limit them, them too. I'm sure it won't be perfect. I, I'm not uh, particularly a utopian type person, uh, but I do think progress in technology tends to make people's lives better. And, you know, hopefully this broad mantle of Web3 uh, will make the internet a better place as it increasingly, you know, dictates and dominates our lives. I'm curious since you, I got the DAO guy with me. For you, what do you think the future of media as a DAO looks like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're seeing a lot of really interesting experiments with, um, with how media can be created in a more uh, collaborative way, how media can be monetized in different ways, how people can use you know, this seamless crowdfunding uh, mechanics to possibly fund higher quality media or media that people want to read about. Um, which I think has really interesting ways to impact investigative journalism or, you know, more long form type pieces, which increasingly kind of have evaporated from the internet. Um, and then I think on top of it, it's creating new ways to create kind of a, like a, a group of people that are working together, i.e. like a DAO, uh, using these digital assets as kind of a, like a membership pass or, or a token that you need to, in order to participate. And my hope is, is that the kind of wave of user-generated content that we saw in Web 2, uh, things like Wikipedia and other platforms, this may be a way for all of those types of groups to begin to work together uh, and hopefully monetize that, that work in a more efficient way. You know, whether that's an encyclopedia like Wikipedia or, you know, long-form content like a magazine would have or videos or, or memes, whatever, whatever people want to do when it comes to media, uh, but to do it in a way that's a little bit more open and collaborative and more transparent uh, than, you know, kind of a top-down hierarchical editor-driven or, you know, kind of a um, centralized uh, decision-making process that, that I, that, that's at least my impression of how lots of media organizations work today. What is your Web3 2022 prediction? 
Web3 2022 prediction. You know, I, I think that there will be probably ups and downs in the market. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of exuberance in lots of different areas of the market. Um, I think what's really exciting is that a lot of the technical tools are going to be coming, um, you know, to fruition to hopefully solve some of those user uh, barriers and other pain points that we were describing before. And I think what's exciting is that people are experimenting so much. So from that experimentation, I am sure that there will be things that I, we never could have predicted that, that emerge in, in kind of 2022. But I do think we're kind of in the middle of something that looks a lot like the mid-1990s with Web1. And um, you know, with that, we have you know, lots of exuberance, which may be overstated uh, in, the, in the near term, but probably is not overstated in the long run. Um, and it's, I think, going to be a pretty exciting year.